It's good to be here with you this evening as we come together to worship the Lord and to hear his word. Isaiah chapter 40 and the first 11 verses. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all people will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All people are like grass, and all their faithfulness is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers, the flowers fall, because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flowers fall, but the word of our God endures forever. You who bring good news to Zion, go up on a high mountain. You who bring good news to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up, do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. See, the sovereign Lord comes with power and he rules with a mighty arm. See, his reward is with him, and his recompense accompanies him. He tends his flock like a shepherd, and gathers the lambs in his arms, and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. So reads the precious word of God. While I'm preaching, I'd like just to have a moment or two to think about the work of God in this world, the spreading of the gospel. And after I retired, I worked for 16 years for Wycliffe Bible Translators. So it's good to know you've got an interest in Wycliffe. So two little stories really about Wycliffe, one near the beginning and the other at the end. A lot more could be said, but uh, maybe another time. But uh, Wycliffe began when a young man called William Cameron Townsend in 1917 went to Guatemala in Central America to sell Spanish Bibles. But nobody would buy them because the majority of the people didn't understand Spanish. So Spanish was no good to them. Nor did they have any written form of their own language, which was Cachacuel. So Townsend abandoned attempts to sell Spanish Bibles and began living among the Catechol people. One day, one man said to him, if your God is so great, why can't he speak our language? And that was what God used to stir up Cameron Townsend to begin Bible translation. Twelve years later, he completed the translation of the New Testament in Kachakel. And uh, Wycliffe Bible Translators was, was born, and the work went on from there. The UK branch began in 1953. So that's Wycliffe beginnings. Today there are apparently 8 billion people in this world speaking 7,168 different languages, and at the moment there's still nothing translated into 1,680 languages. They are smaller languages, they're not dialects, they are languages, there are people groups, and that's about 125 million people who can't do what you've been doing tonight, opening the Bible and, and reading it. So there's still a great need. So another little story from Wycliffe, and I, I've got a picture here of, of this guy whose, whose name 
is Kodia Oda. Kodia Oda. This picture was taken when he was oh, just a lad about 50 or so years ago. He was brought up in West Africa among the Togo people. He was in a particular people group called the IFE, I-F-E, and uh, his parents dedicated him to be a voodoo priest. So he wasn't allowed to go to school. He was kept for this voodoo priesthood. But one day, some evangelists came into his village and they preached the gospel. And, and Kodja heard about Jesus. And in the mercy of God, he trusted the Savior. His parents were mad at that. But he was 15 by this time, and so he uh, told them he was going to follow Jesus, and that was it. He went to a little church in a local village, and in 2011, the New Testament translation of the Ifi had been completed. So he learned to read, and he read God's Word. He read the New Testament. And he grew in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus. And this is a recent picture of him because eventually he felt called into the ministry and became a pastor among that people group. But uh, he has got one big problem, and it's this. He's only got half a loaf. He's got the New Testament, but he wants the Old Testament as well. Why shouldn't the people, the Arthur people, have the Old Testament in their language as well as the New Testament? You've got it. I've got it. And some have got it. And so our prayer would be that the IP people group and the work has started now would get the Old Testament in their language so that Kodja can use it in the teaching and preaching in the little church where he is now the pastor. I don't know if you see the Wycliffe magazine ever, but I've got two spare copies here. I'm happy to leave them. If you want one, well, it's the first two to get them. I can have one, then you can pass them around. It's a good magazine. Lots in it to pray about, lots of news as to what's happening in Wycliffe in these days. Well, we have the Old Testament and the New Testament too, so let's have a second reading. This time it's from Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2 and the first 20 verses. They'll be familiar words. I trust they'll still warm your hearts as we read them. Luke 2, beginning at verse 1. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a saviour has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favour rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem 
and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherd said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. So read God's precious word. So we're coming up to Christmas, and some people say that the four Sundays leading up to Christmas are Advent Sundays, and uh, they usually have a, a theme for each one. And uh, today is the third Sunday in Advent, and the theme for today is joy. And my text is here in Luke chapter 2, and in verse 10, if you take your Bibles, you'll see it there. Luke 2 and verse 10. Where to frightened shepherds, the angel says, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Good news of great joy for all the people. Many of the carols that we sing and will be singing over Christmas will, uh, like the one we started with tonight, emphasise joy. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. So I want us to be encouraged by this tonight and to think about the whole matter of Christian joy as it centres around the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to say three things as we look at this text together this good news that will cause great joy for all people. The first thing I want you to notice with me is the contrast of this great joy. The contrast. The contrast with the joy that this world often speaks about. There is, of course, nothing necessarily wrong with earthly joy and happiness. After all, we don't want everyone to go around looking miserable as can be, do we? It's good to be joyful, but the joys of this world are nowhere near like the joys that there are in the Lord Jesus Christ. Earthly joy sometimes can be false. People put on a brave face, give a cheery smile, when underneath they're hiding sorrow, problems, trials and difficulties. That's false. Sometimes earthly joy can be fragile, affected by people, circumstances that suddenly change. There's a drop in the interest rates and there's a drop in the smile on people's faces because they've lost something and it makes a difference. It's fragile. It can be spoilt by pain and suffering, by <coughs> poverty, by persecution, by life's problems. And sometimes earthly joy is fleeting. It's here today and gone tomorrow. And people talk about the good old days as it used to be, as if they were always good and trouble-free. And of course, that's not true. And of course, for some people anyway, the time of Christmas itself isn't a joyful time, but a time of sadness because of the loss of a loved one or because of some difficulty or broken relationship. So, so much for the contents of earthly joy. Think by contrast of heavenly joy, the joy that's spoken about here, this good news that causes great joy. This joy is not dependent upon people or possessions or situations. This is a joy that comes from God, from heaven. This is what the Lord Jesus declared in John 15, verse 11, when he said, I've told you this so that my joy 
may be in you and your joy may be complete. Indeed, this joy is even enhanced by problems, by pain, by persecution. Think of Habakkuk and his situation. Read Habakkuk 3 verse 17. And all the problems, though the fig tree does not bud, there are no grapes on the vines, the olive crop fails, the fields produce no food, there are no sheep in the pen, no cattle in the stalls. What a situation. Habakkuk goes on, yet I will rejoice in the Lord, I'll be joyful in God my Saviour. Or Hebrews 10 verse 34, where it says, You suffered, along with those in prison, joyfully accepting the confiscation of your property, because you knew that you yourselves had better <coughs> and lasting possessions. That's heavenly joy. That's the joy that's emphasised at Christmas but runs through the pages of Holy Scripture. What a contrast. So secondly, let me draw your attention to the character of this great joy. What is it like? The Greek word that's used here for joy can be translated by gladness or cheerfulness or even calm delight. It's used, and I haven't counted these up, okay, but it's used 59 times in the New Testament. If you've got a concordance, you can count them up and check up and let me know if that's not right. But this joy, what's it like? Well, first, it is inexpressible. How do you describe it? How do you sum it up? Listen to what we read in 1 Peter 1 verse 8. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him. And listen, and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. Isn't that wonderful? We're speechless in a sense because it's inestimable, it's immeasurable, it's indescribable. And it's given to believers. The psalmist says in Psalm 16 verse 11, in your presence is fullness of joy. So it's inexpressible. Secondly, looking at the character of this great joy, it is internal. It's that which is in the heart. It's that which is within us. Isaiah 60 verse 5, Isaiah prophesying concerning the future of God's people says, then you will look and be radiant, your heart will throb and swell with joy. Does that happen for you? When you think of the Lord Jesus and the good news that, that Christmas signals and ushers in, does your heart throb with joy as you sing? Something like, joy to the world, the Lord is come. Or do you think, oh, just another carol? It's that which is internal. Think of Mary. Mary at the good news that she was to bear the Saviour. Mary at the angel's message to her. Luke 147, she says, My soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Saviour. Despite all the circumstances and all the challenges that were going to follow, inwardly she was stirred. She was rejoicing in God. So it's inexpressible, it's internal, it's infectious. If someone's happy, you can see, can't you? You can tell it, it spreads. If someone's having a good laugh about something on an ordinary level, laughter spreads, but this is so much greater. So that writing to the Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians 8 verse 2, the apostle declares, in the midst of very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. Their overflowing joy. Does it overflow from you when you talk to fellow believers? Or do they get lots of moans and groans and all the trials and troubles and all the rest of it? 
Are there some people you don't like to say, how are you? Because you might get a long diatribe of all their aches and pains. Are there some people you like to say, how are you? Because from within, as they share what God has been doing in their hearts, it brings a note of joy and thanksgiving. It's infectious. The psalmist could say in Psalm 71, verse 23, when he thinks about the deliverance that, that God has accomplished for him, my lips will shout for joy when I sing praise to you. It, it spreads from him. Or, or again, the Apostle Paul, when he writes to the Corinthians, a church that had its troubles and so on, 2 Corinthians 2, verse 3, he says, I have confidence that you would all share my joy. Isaac Watts him, based on, on that passage in Isaiah 35, where he writes, Come you that love the Lord, and let your joys be known. Join in a song with sweet accord, and thus surround the throne. Your night it is a great hymn, and it speaks of that infectious joy. And also, when we think of it, we see it is incessant joy. It's that which continues. It's that which always shall be there. The psalmist in Psalm 5.11 says, But let all who take refuge in you be glad. Let them ever sing for joy. Is that true of us? Do we know that incessant joy? I must confess that all too often we don't. It's interesting, isn't it, the contrast that you get in 2 Corinthians 6, verse 10, where the apostle says that we're sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. That's amazing. You may be in trouble. You may be sad. There may be difficult circumstances. You may have unsolved problems. There may be heartaches that make you sorrowful. But underneath, because you belong to Jesus Christ, always rejoicing. Because he is the answer. And he sees us through. The verse I mentioned just now, Isaiah 35, verse 10, talks about those the Lord has rescued will return. They will enter Zion with singing. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them. And sorrow and sighing will flee away. Incessant joy. The story is told of the Cornish evangelist Billy Bray, who was a rough, tough kind of guy, worked in the mines and so on, and was enthusiastic with his spreading of the gospel. And, and uh, when they went out with music, he would, he would beat the drum. And I think someone had told him not to bash the drum so hard because of, of uh, the damage it might do, or the noise he was making. And his reply, so I'm told, is, I'm so happy I could bust the blooming drum. <laughs> he was so full of the joy of the Lord. Well, that's the joy that's being spoken of here. That's the character of this great joy. So thirdly and finally, what's the cause then of this great joy? Well, you, you've seen the text. You know what we read here in these verses that we've just shared together. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. For today in the town of David, a saviour has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. Here is the heart of the matter. The good news that brings great joy centres on the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the cause of great joy even if everything else has gone wrong. That's what the angel shares with those frightened shepherds. There is no greater joy than this. It is great joy, first because it's of the greatest person. Our Lord Jesus Christ, you is born a saviour, Christ the Lord. Well, Matthew says, Emmanuel, God with us. Well, my favourite text, which you'll know well, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, 
that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. That's the center for this joy. It's Jesus, our Lord Jesus. Consider him. Trust him. Dwell on him. Listen to him. Follow him. Tell of him. Honor him. Wait for him. You're doing all those things? Wow. We had a, a, a prayer letter from a, a pastor that we pray for at Long Crendon Baptist Church, Pastor Julian, who is in Romania, and he's had some troubles and trials, and the, the last prayer letter came just a day or two ago, spells out one or two of them. But then he wrote this in his prayer letter, and I just wrote it down to share with you. This is what he said. I live by Jesus. I breathe for Jesus. That's it. He is the heart of the matter. Our Lord Jesus Christ. He's the cause for great joy. No Christ, no joy. You can either spell that K-N-O-W or you can spell it N-O. No Christ, no joy. Or no Christ, no joy. The greatest person is the cause of this great joy. And the greatest price is the cause of this great joy. A saviour has been born to you. I looked up online to see how much people are spending this Christmas. And the average UK household, so one website says anyway, spending this Christmas is £1,811.70. That's an odd number, isn't it? But that's an average of what people are spending this Christmas. And that means that some are spending far more and some a lot less. But uh, the cause of our joy is priceless. 2 Corinthians 8, 9 says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, though he was rich, Yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. Think of Christ and what it cost him. Leaving the splendor of heaven, being at the Father's side, and all that was beautiful and glorious about that, and leaving that behind. He was rich, but he made himself nothing. He became poor for us. Or as 1 Peter 1 puts it in verse 18, for you know that it was not with perishable things like silver and gold that you redeemed from the empty way of life, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. What a cost. What a price. Jesus' priceless treasure begins one of the old hymns. The greatest price. Wow, he did that for you and for me. Isn't that amazing? How far would you go to help someone who was your enemy? What would you do for someone who's against you? The Lord Jesus gave his all. Christ died for our sins. Isn't that amazing? It's the greatest joy also because it speaks of the greatest provision. Good news that will cause great joy for all the people. This is the best news this world has ever known. This is good news for everyone. This is what is to be declared. 1 Timothy 1.15 says that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. You're a sinner. You need a saviour. So do I. And the Lord Jesus is that saviour. He told his disciples to go and make disciples of all nations. And we should be concerned about that, to tell others about the Lord Jesus Christ. We had a lovely service at Long Crendon just a, a week or two back when five people were baptised by immersion, giving testimony to their faith in the Lord Jesus and listening to their stories. Two of them have been drug addicts. By the grace of God, had been rescued and were now committed to the Lord Jesus Christ. Lovely testimonies. How wonderful. Ransomed, healed, 
restored, forgiven, who like thee his praise should sing. And it also is the cause of great joy that's found in the greatest promise. Isn't it wonderful? The promises that we have in Christ. How many promises in the Bible? Well, if you have got Herbert Lockyer's book, All the Promises in the Bible, he brings it down to 7,487. You can check it if you like. I haven't done that. How many promises can you remember by heart that, you know, mean something to you? What about Matthew 28, 20, where Jesus says, Surely I'm with you always. What's better than that? His presence in difficult times as well as good. You know, sometimes when we've got problems, some of our friends, so-called, don't really want to know, do they? No, not yet, not now. But the Lord Jesus, in the midst of the worst about us, never leaves his children. That's his promise. I will never leave you, nor forsake you. Go home tonight, get a pen and paper, and write down all the promises that you can think of. And uh, if you find you've got more than 7,487, let me know. The greatest promise. And, and then, as, as we think again of the cause of this great joy, it has the greatest prospect, doesn't it? The greatest prospect. Someone said to you tonight, what are your prospects? Well, it depends where you're at, with work or in retirement, what you're looking forward to, what you're doing, what you hope for. There is no greater prospect than the glories of heaven. Jesus said, in my Father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. Think about heaven. Think again of that psalm I mentioned earlier, Psalm 16, verse 11. You have made known to me the path of life. You have filled me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. There is no better future than that which the Christian has, than that which the person who belongs to Christ knows. Dwell on that. And when you see other people and you, they do things you can't do and wish you could, or they've got improvements or acceptance or all the rest of it, measure them up against that. What a prospect is ours. Isn't that wonderful? We used to sing an old song in Sunday school with the line in it, I am so glad that Jesus loves me. What's better than that? So shepherds, they listened to this good news of great joy for all the people. And what did they do? Well, they went and they found him. And then they went off and they spoke about him. And uh, is that true of us? Do you know the Lord Jesus as saviour? Are you trusting him? And are you speaking of him to others? You know, there's a verse in Nehemiah, if you know Nehemiah, and the difficulties he had with uh, rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem and all the rest of it. He says in uh, Nehemiah 8 verse 10, the joy of the Lord is your strength. There's strength found in knowing that joy that centered in the Lord Jesus Christ. So rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. <laughs>